Thank you, Nathan. I just love uh, worshiping the Lord and coming together. Here we are, last Sunday of 2020. Yeah, some of us are really cheering. Oh, it's over. <laughs> and yet, I look at this, I look back on the year, and I look back on all the different things, and I think one of the things that's so common as we come up to 2021, we, we want to stop and take stock of where we are with the Lord, where, where have we been this past year in our lives, our family, our, our fortunes, how has it gone, where are we now? And where are we now? We're, we're in the house of the Lord. We're worshiping a king who's worthy to be praised. And, and where are we going from here? What, what are we going to find in 2020? How's our vision going to uh, be as we go that way? Did you find what you were hoping for? Did you find what you were seeking in 2020? I, I, I pray you did. That's kind of where our message is at this morning. And as you think about maybe what you had hoped for, dreamed for, prayed for for 2020, as we look at 2021 and people, you know, it's the tradition that everybody wants to make some New Year's resolution that I promise I will or I promise I won't. And, and these types of things, as we look into 2021, I think really it comes down to just a day-by-day -day choice or decision that we make. Um, and so today... I have to ask the question. I ask myself this question every Sunday, and I encourage you all to ask this question of yourself every Sunday. When the alarm clock goes off and you roll out of bed, you might want to ask yourself, why am I going to church today? You might think it's kind of funny for a pastor to ask that question. It's your job. You know, it's your duty. It's your obligation. You've got to be there. Why did I come to church? Why am I here this morning? What am I seeking? What do I hope to find? What I hope to get? What do I hope to give? What have I brought this morning as we come to church? I'm going to want to play you a little theme music for a second if our IT works properly. And this is probably all on me, but I, I just want you to listen to this and see if it sounds familiar to any of you, or maybe you can even tell me where it comes from. Let's see if this is going to work. Hang back to me. Christmas story as we are 
right between Christmas and New Year's and looking into 2021 and wondering what is it that we're seeking, what are we hoping to find, what are we hoping to get, what are we hoping to give. And the, the, the story begins in Matthew chapter 2 at verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. Let's pray. Father God, we pray right now that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would touch each person in this room. Lord, please touch each one of us personally and individually. Speak to us in our heart what it is that you would have us know this morning. Help us, Lord, to... Receive your word, hear your word, and then do what it is you put on our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen? Okay, not the good and the bad and the ugly, but three characters, three kings, or three kingdoms, if you will, are laid out there. We've got Herod. I'm not sure if he's the bad or the ugly, but he's not the good. We've got these three kings, if you will, wise men from the east. And we have the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the beautiful King. And it's an interesting story of how this all goes together. But it starts with now after Jesus was born. Spoiler warning, I don't want to wreck your nativity. But the kings weren't there. We have this little nativity set we have carved out of wood. We got in the Philippines and this year uh, we have our grandson with us and we're teaching him about the nativity and who's that? That's Jesus. Who's that? That's Mary. Who's that? Oh, that's a shepherd. Who's that? Those are the kings. And yet he looks at that and he took our angel and he used our angel kind of like some kind of a weapon. <laughs> and he just shatters the nativity, right? That's what little boys do. <laughs> and so here we're trying to build the nativity set and yet there's going to come a day where he's going to have to learn that the kings weren't there. It says after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. And so this is something that's going to happen. And I, again, I want to correct your calendar if I can. The birth of Jesus is most probably about 2 B.C. 2 and B.C. stands for before Christ. How does a person get born before they even have his birthday or he's born, right? And, and this is just a, a technical error. There was a... Um, ancient historian by the name of Josephus and he wrote correctly but then it was mistranslated and for about 400 years everybody was going off the mistranslation it was during that time that they started updating the calendars and we came up with our Gregorian calendar and then our calendars were set according to the error in Josephus' writings we've since found the error of our ways and reset the clock and so Jesus' birth is about 2 B.C. Uh, according to uh, the evidence that we have in front of us right now. So, at any rate, this story this morning is after Jesus was born. We did Jesus was born last Sunday, right, in Luke chapter 2. And they gave birth to a child and laid him in a manger. And the angel saying, glory to God, peace and goodwill to mankind. And, and the shepherds came and told the story. Well, we're about... About two years later, let's kind of get into this as we go. It says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Now, if you're a Bible scholar, you've read the Bible much, you know there's many Herods in the Bible. Herod is really a title um, for a man or people who are in rule. And uh, this one is the original, okay? He's the, the grand happy of them all. He's the big Herod. You could say the Herod with the capital G, or grandfather, or uncle of them all. He lived about 73 B.C. till about 4 B.C., okay? Um, and he's known as, or nicknamed, Herod the Great, okay? And uh, a lot of that is because he had this huge ego and incredible ambition. And he wanted to be known and remembered throughout all of history. So one of the things he's most noted for are these colossal building projects. Okay? It's known as Herodian architecture because it uses such big 
blocks and pieces. And one of his uh, projects was the renovation of the temple of, in Israel, in Jerusalem. Uh, he decided to give it an upgrade, a facelift. And so he took these stones, some of them you can see them today at the western wall, are like 30 feet long and 12 feet tall, umpteen tons of stone, huge, and he built this huge bulwark, this retaining wall around the temple area, built it up and leveled it out. To the present day, it's 35 square acres that he built, and then he did all these modifications to really make the temple in Jerusalem one of the, mo one of the wonders of the world in, in uh, the times that we're reading about right here. He did all kinds of other things. He built the Antonio Fortress. He built the um, Fortress in Masada, some amazing things, aqueducts throughout the land. Um, he broke, built hippodromes. These are like racetracks for entertainment. You can see that at Caesarea Philippi if you go there. He built tons of theaters. Uh, and the idea of the theaters where people could come and see the, the plays of the Greek and Roman pantheon of the gods and demigods and all of this. And it was to inculcate the culture into this Greek Roman mindset. It was a way of spreading propaganda throughout the known realm. And he didn't just limit his uh, building projects to Jerusalem or Israel. He was a great contributor in Athens and Sparta and Rhodes. And he built all kinds of temples to foreign gods, pagan gods. And he was a huge contributor to the Olympic Games. He would be like, possibly in our day and age, uh, a character like George Soros. Okay? And if you're hip to who George Soros is, you know, you may have a different opinion than others. In my heart, when I hear of Herod in this Bible story, I want to say, boom. He's the bad guy. He's not a good guy. In fact, this family of Herod's had to be one of the most messed up families in history. It's so messed up, I'll probably get it wrong if I try to explain it, so I'm going to read it off this sheet of paper. Okay? Herod the Great, who was the Herod at the time of the birth of Jesus, he was not Jewish, but an Edomite. And he was appointed by Caesar to rule over the Roman province of Israel. He came to power through cunning and intrigue and deceit and deception. He was very instrumental in helping Octavius wrest power from Anthony during the time of Anthony and Cleopatra. Okay? And because of that, Octavian, who became the first of the Caesars, decided to bless this Herod with a kingdom. So he sent him out to the province of Judea and made him king over Judea. But he wasn't even Jewish. It says he's an Edomite, okay? He's from the land of Edom, okay? To the east of Jerusalem, they're really mortal enemies. Even in the scriptures, in Malachi, it talks about in verse 1, verse 3, God himself says, Jacob I have loved, speaking of Israel. Esau I have hated, speaking of Edom and Moab. It's quoted again in the book of Romans. And so... Throughout the scriptures, this Herod was a bad guy. It goes on to say he was not Jewish, but an Edomite, appointed by Caesar to rule over the Roman province of Israel. Herod the Great was one, the one that ordered all the babies in the area of Bethlehem to be killed, who were two years old and under. Boo. You can boo anytime you want. He was paranoid. He was always fearful that someone was going to try to kill him and take the throne. Part of his paranoia may have been the result of his short stature. He stood about four feet, nine inches tall. But for a little man, he had great ambitions, and whenever he would build something, he would build it of huge stones, okay? This is where he got the nickname, Herod the Great. Because he was so paranoid of any rivals, when his first wife, Doris, had a son, he killed them both. Then he married another, yeah, who said that? <laughs> go, go, say that daughter. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's, that's terrible, that's rotten, right? He's afraid of rivals from the throne, so he kills his wife and his son. Okay? Then he married another woman named Miriam. I guess he liked the name. And she had two sons. Get ready. Now, one of these two sons had a daughter named Herodias. Then Herod thought Miriam and the two sons were plotting against him, so he put her and the two sons to death. <laughs> a saying developed amongst the Romans that it was safer to be Herod's pig than to be his son. 
Because in the province of Israel, they didn't butcher pigs, so you'd be better off than the king's son to be a pig. Because the point was, he wiped out all of his wives and sons. After killing Miriam, he began to mourn for her. He had bad feelings, so he built a tower in Jerusalem as a monument to her because he missed her so much, and you can see that today. Then he married another girl by the name of Miriam, and they had a son named Herod Philip. So this is one of the other Herods you'll read in the Bible who married his niece, Herodias. Yeah, I don't know if that's a dude. And the daughter of his assassinated half-brother. They moved to Rome, away from the father, where he became a wealthy merchant, and they had a daughter whom they, they named Salome. You'll run into Salome later in the Bible. She's the one that's danced before the king, and he cut off John the Baptist's head and gave it to her on a platter. I could go on reading, but the point is, this is one messed up dude, and was one messed up family, one messed up dynasty, it's really bad. It's really ugly. But this is where the story is set. This is where we are. Matthew lays out, it was after the birth of Jesus Christ uh, in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Okay? So we got the background on Herod. It says, and behold, uh, I'm sorry, Saying, I'll start with it. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Okay, the wise men. You may have heard uh, the song, We Three Kings of Orient are traveling a long ways to give Jesus a bunch of presents. <laughs> so I'm not a composer, okay? But you know the song, all right? But well, here we see they're really introduced as wise men from the east, from the Orient, okay? The, the word that you would get if you translate this out of the original language is magi, okay? And we've heard of the magi that come to visit Jesus and give him gifts. Well, that's what this is speaking from, magi, wise men from the east. Magi is plural for the word magus. And it's from magus or magi that we get the word for magic or magician, because these guys were so wise and understood and studied nature and the laws of physics and, and things. They had such a command of the facts that they seemed to almost be magical. They could tell you when a certain event was going to happen in the stars, okay? They were astrologers. They studied the sky, the night sky and the stars, and they're known as the magi. Okay? It's fun in the Philippines, we had the three wise men that actually lived with us. There was a set of triplets born. Okay? And then according to tradition, because we don't actually know the name of the wise guys, but I do because we live with them. They go by the name of Gaspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. How'd you like to grow up? This is my brother Gaspar, this is ba uh, Balthazar, and I'm Melchior, right? But anyways, these guys came. And in the Bible, we see these magicians, if you will, these magi, the magus. And there's good and there's bad in that, okay? Bad magician, you can find in Acts chapter 8, his name was Simon. He's known as the sorcerer, okay? And he used his powers of magic and divination to deceive people and to gain wealth to himself. In fact, he, when he saw the power of the Holy Spirit in action to heal and to prophesy and do wonderful things, he approached the disciples and said, I want to buy that. How much for the Holy Spirit? Right? There's a bad guy, okay? A bad magician. And Peter rebukes him and curses him, and, and uh, it doesn't come to pass. But then there's other magi or maguses that are mentioned in the Bible. In fact, um, some of the early church fathers and authors, Origen by name, Philo by name, they wrote about this school of the Magi in the East, a Persian school of what we would call proto-scientists. They were the early scientists of their day. They were observing nature, the stars, the seasons, and these kinds of things, and figuring out how the world worked. They were really bright, very intelligent, um, and the Bible rightly calls them wise men. They were quite wise, okay? Um, and. Uh, one of those, I think that's really interesting for us that we have in the Bible, is a young man by the name of Daniel. There's a book in the Bible 
given to Daniel and the story of Daniel. And you might remember some of the things about Daniel. He and his three friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, right? Or uh, Mishael, Azariah, and Hananiah were deported during the captivity of Israel to Babylon about 605 B.C. So about 600 years before the story in front of us today, Daniel was taken captive. We read in Daniel chapter 1 at verse 19 and 20, they purposed in their heart not to uh, enjoy the delicacies of the king, but to keep themselves holy and pure, set apart for God, following just the Bible, the scriptures that they had. And they did a test, and when the test was done, we read in verse 19, the king interviewed them, and among them none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, for they served before the king. And in all the matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. So they went through this special training session where they were just going to be um, given all types of training in, in science and the culture and the history and the language. And they kept themselves apart from the king and they were extremely bright and brilliant. Ten times better than any of the other proto-scientists, any of the other magi of their day. It says in chapter 2 of verse 48, or verse 48 of chapter 2 in the book of Daniel, Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. The term for that chief administrator is Rab Mab. He made Daniel a Rab Mag. Mag is for Magus, Magi, and Rab is chief. So he was the chief of the Magi. This is in your Bible. This is a, the, the, the person Daniel, and of course his three friends, Rakshak and Benny. And they were brilliant, and they knew the things of the Lord, and they studied the skies, and they understood what was going on. Now, according to Origen and Philo and this uh, school of the Magi in the East, a lot of people connect the dots and say, maybe these Magi that are coming to follow the star of Jesus Christ Maybe they're from that school that was in the east, that was in Babylon, about 800 to 1,000 miles to the east, and maybe they're the ones that studied this and came forward. There's more evidence as it starts developing that they were probably connected to that, okay? Um, they came from the region of Mesopotamia, and it would have taken them probably anywhere, these three kings that we read in our text, um, maybe about 40 days to travel there. Um, if they came on foot, traveling about 20 miles a day, right? And, or I should say, maybe traveling 20 miles a night because they followed the star. Ah, right? <laughs> At any rate, these are these magi. So now we have two characters, right? We've got, boo, Herod. We've got the wise man, yay, right? And then we've got the star, right? The Christmas star. And this is really, really cool. Um, what is this Christmas star? What's it all about? You know, the Philippines, uh, as we celebrate Christmas, and, you know, Cheryl and I serve there, Lloyd and Sherry serve there. Uh, we've got Filipinos here in the room, right? And, you know, the big symbol of Christmas in the Philippines is the star. And it's referring to the star of Matthew chapter 2, the star of Christ's birth. And so there's all kinds of things from these simple, modest uh, stars that are made, lanterns with uh, bent bamboo in the shape of a six-pointed star covered with rice paper. You place a candle inside them, and, they, and you can carry them around. And, and, uh, and this Christmas star, all the way to super elaborate, almost gaudy displays of the star, but they don't have, or they are nowadays getting Christmas trees or Santa Claus and all that kind of stuff. But in the Philippines, a star is really bringing you back to what the message, the meaning of Christmas is all about. And these wise men, they were tuned in. They knew about this star. Interesting. How did they learn about this star? Um, it's the star in the east, we see. And so where they are in, in uh, the east of Jerusalem, they would have looked up in the night sky and seen something going on in the heavens, riddled it out and said, hmm, what are you guys doing tomorrow? I don't know. Let's get some cameras and follow that star. Why would they follow that star? Well, let's look at the scriptures. These were wise men. They knew the scriptures, probably of the school of Daniel. 
Mishael, Azariah, Hananiah. They were people of the Word of God. And the Word of God tells us in Genesis, chapter 1, right up front, verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from night, and let them be for signs and seasons, days and years. Let them be for signs and seasons. Signs is the word of in Hebrew, and seasons is the word moed in Hebrew. Let them be for oaths and moed. And what this really is, this idea of an oath, is a sigma. Or it's an omen, it's a miracle, it's evidence. The stars were put up in the heavens to tell us a story. The Bible says it right here, Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. God put them in the sky for signs. And it says seasons, moed. And those seasons, those moed, are the days when people are to gather together, according to the Bible, for the feasts. The Feast of Passover, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Tabernacles. These are the feast days. We are supposed to be able to look from Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, before God even created Adam and Eve, he put the stars in the heaven so people could know when it's time to come to church. People could know when it's time to have Passover. People could know how they could understand God. He put that up in the sky for mankind to understand. They're supposed to speak to us. In fact, in Romans, in chapter 10, I love this, and you've probably heard this before, but as Paul is laying out the gospel, he says in Romans 10, chapter 14, how shall they call on him, God, in whom they shall not believe? And how shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? He goes on to say, and you've heard this before, I'm sure. So, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by, how's it go, team? Hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they, this is talking about the nation of Israel, have they not heard? And Paul goes and he says, yes, indeed. And he quotes the Old Testament. He says, their sound has gone out to all their earth, and their words to the end of the world. Whose sound? Whose words? What is Paul talking about? Well, if you go to Psalm 19, which is what he just quoted here, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and he says, their sound, speaking of the stars, the stars' sound, the stars' message, the stars' oath, the stars' evidence has gone out into the, all the world. In Psalm 19, Verses 1 through 4, this is what Paul quoted, but I'll give you the whole package. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament, that's the heavens, shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their line or their sound or their message has gone out throughout all the earth, their words to the end of the world. Paul is saying they're without excuse. Every person walking the planet can look up and see the stars, and the stars speak of our Creator. The God, stars speak of God and His power and His love uh, for us. And so it's kind of interesting how that all works out. Now, there's a thing in Judaism called the Maserat. And the Maserat is a way to look up and understand the message of the stars, okay? Before I go into this, I don't want you to get turned off at me before I have a chance to lay out my case. I am not talking about astrology. Astrology is some kind of thing where people give stars some kind of divine power over people. And that according to how they interpret the stars, it has influence over your life and your destiny. Stars are just burning balls of gas. Okay? They can't influence you. Okay? They're more like a thermometer than a thermostat. Right? A thermometer can simply read the temperature and tell you if it's hot or cold. 
They indicate something. Stars can tell you what their message is. Okay? And this is what God clearly laid out from Genesis chapter 1 with the Magi, Daniel, the school of Magi, these wise guys. They understood. They could look into the heavens and there was something up there to us. Now, in the Masara, there is an understanding of the constellations. Now, if you've ever looked up in the sky and studied astronomy, you're probably familiar with some of the constellations. I think most of us, even in elementary school, somebody tries to point out to us uh, Orion or the Big Dipper. Any of you guys seen any of that stuff? How on earth can you see it? It's just a bunch of dots in the sky. There's no lines, right? But somebody kind of pointed out to you and you go, hmm, that does look like a Dipper, okay? Well, According to Judaism and the tradition, and it's not in the Bible, so I'm on the land of speculation right now. I'm putting out some of these facts that are verifiable. You can research them and look them up. But according to tradition in Judaism, they believe that Seth, the son of Adam, was given the names of the stars. In Isaiah, the scriptures say that God just flung them out into space and called them all by name. And when it says he called them all by name, not only did he name them, but it says that they answered him. That's what called by name means. It's like if I call um, Ike to come up to the stage, only one of you in the room is coming up because I called him by name. This is what God does with the stars, okay? He put them out there. There's a purpose. They have a message. He's ordered that. And so we've got these stars up in the heavens that declare the glory of God, and their speech goes forth into all the world. Now, Building this case a little bit further, it's astronomy, okay? Just looking at the stars, what do they say? If you go to Galilee, uh, you go to Israel, right? You tour the, the Holy Land. You go to the Sea of Galilee. Along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, there's a church. And in the floor of this church, one of the things that's fun to look at everywhere you go is all of the decorations. And there's a mosaic, a tile laid out in the floor. It's not a church, I should say. It's a synagogue. It's a first century synagogue from the time of Christ. And you know what the pattern on the mosaic on the floor is? Brace yourself. It's the zodiac. What is a zodiac doing in a Jewish house of worship in the time of Christ? Well, we know it as a zodiac because of the horoscope in your newspaper or whatever. But what it was was the Maserat. It was God explaining the story of the birth of Christ. If you know anything about astrology, and it's hard not to in this world, it's all around us. People are like, who's so And all this kind of stuff. Well, if you are the sign of Virgo, what month were you born in? Anybody? September. How do you know? Oh, you're okay. <laughs> I knew somebody would say that in a room this size. Okay. Why do the constellations start in September? Anybody wonder about that? If you study the Maserat, if you study the message in the stars that God gave to Seth, handed down to the patriarchs, came up through Job, came up through Daniel, you'll find that the first constellation is the constellation Virgo, the virgin. The story starts there. And as you work your way through the constellations, you'll find things like Aries and Capricorn, the Ram, the Lamb of God. Do you know what the last constellation as you go around is? Anybody? It comes right before Virgo, so if you're not in September, you must have been August. Leo. Leo, the Lion, the Lion of Judah. Now, I, I lay all this out for you, and you're probably saying, man, I came to church this morning, this guy is way out the weeds, okay? <laughs> I want, I'm trying to pull all these things together for you because when you look at the Bible and you dig in and you really do your homework and you mine it, you go, man, this thing is loaded with stuff. I realize most of you don't have the time, you haven't had uh, the opportunity to dig in and study these things. That's what I do, okay? That's why I'm bringing this to you for. I would strongly, strongly, strongly take away any uh, thought of getting into astrology for any of you guys here. But astronomy is a hard science. I took astronomy in college. I needed a science class. 
And uh, I love the stars. I, since I've been a little boy, I've looked up there. I thought, I want to take astronomy. I'm just going to dial this thing in. And it's true. I learned all kinds of stars by name. I could look at the night sky, pick out all these constellations. But just a, a little, uh, I don't know, college hack for any of you guys. If you take astronomy in college, you're going to have to do a lot of math. Uh, you can't believe how to project the orbits of satellites and moons and all this kind of stuff. You have to do equations that are multiple pages long. I hate that. But I love astronomy. It was terrible. I mean, I worked all week on one math problem. And I'm not even joking about that. I'm going on my friends, how do we do this? I got it right, but it took all week to do one math problem in my astronomy class. It's a hard science. It, it's, it's solid. This is why NASA and the European Space Administration are able to launch rockets and land them on comets. This thing is hurtling through the sky at thousands of miles an hour off of a moving platform, and they land it, and they, or they do some kind of polo jump, and they bring up rocks and they bring them back. I guess you can just do that on a Okay, this is hard science we're talking about. The stars in the sky that God put up there in the sky, and it's just amazing the message that they have. Well, let's go back a little bit further back in our way back machine to the book of Numbers. And you might remember in the book of Numbers, or you might not, so I'll help you. In Numbers 22 through 24, the nation of Israel has been wandering the desert for 40 years. They're just about to go into the promised land. They just have to cross one other nation. You know what nation it was? Moab. Moab and Edom, the place Herod's from. Well, back in the days of the Israelites wandering and coming into the promised land, it wasn't Herod, it was another bad king by the name of Balak. And Balak wanted to thwart the Jews from coming into the promised land, but he knew he was no match for the God of Israel. So what he did was he found a man of God, a man who understood the Jewish God, and he hired him, a prophet for a prophet, a mercenary missionary. He hired him to go curse in the name of God the Israelites so they couldn't enter the promised land. You might remember Balaam was his name, took up the offer, got on his donkey, and started riding up the mountain to curse the people. On the way up the mountain, he and the donkey encountered the angel of God, of the Lord, standing there with his sword. Now, Balaam couldn't see it, but the donkey could. And the donkey's like, uh-uh, I'm not going that way. And he went off into a field. And so Balaam cursed the donkey. And then he got him back on the road. He went up further. And it was like there's a wall on both sides. The donkey got up on the wall and crushed Balaam's leg. And now Balaam's cursing and swearing and hitting his donkey. And third time, he's trying to go on his way. And the donkey's seeing this angel lord with the sword. And uh-uh, and he just laid down on the ground. And Balaam gets up and he's just whacking him with a stick and everything. And finally, God opens Balaam's eyes and he sees the angel of the Lord. And he says, why are you hitting that donkey? Right? In the process, Balaam, as he's whacking on the donkey, the donkey talks to him. He says, I'm not going that way. There's an angel of the Lord there. He's going to smite us. And what's crazy about the story is Balaam talks back. And they have a conversation. At the end of the day, Balaam, he was trying to be prevented from cursing Israel, but finally God said, go ahead, go up on the mountain, speak to them, but all, what, you open your mouth, the only thing that's going to come out is the words of the Lord. And so he, he went up and he tried to speak curses on the people of Israel, but every time he opened his mouth, blessings came out. Right? Blessings came out. Bal Balak was so mad at him. I paid you good money and you're blessing these people. Well, they're in Numbers 24, 17, this is one of the blessings that came out of his mouth. Remember, this is way back, about 1400 B.C., about 3,500 years ago from this morning as we sit here. And this is what came out of Balaam's mouth as he tried to curse Israel. In Numbers 24, beginning in verse 17, this is his prophecy looking into the future. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob 
A scepter shall arise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy the sons of Tomah. And Edom shall be a possession. Remember Edom? Shall be a possession. Seir also his enemy shall be a possession while Israel does valiantly. Out of Jacob, one shall have a in it and destroy the remains of the city. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, way back in the book of Numbers. How do you think the wise guys knew about that? They read the Bible. They're scriptures. They studied what the Word of God said, and Balaam prophesied. There's a day coming. It's distant. It's far off in the future, but there's a day coming. A star will rise out of Jacob. I'm probably taking way more time than I, and I'm only in two verses.